wanted to get started. I want to first of all say thank you all uh, for joining us this morning. Um, uh, Mr. McCoy is on the way. Uh, there's all kinds of traffic problems. We got a crash on the northern Beltway and a crash in the southern Beltway and a red line, of course, is doing the red line thing. Uh, and so we're slightly delayed in getting, getting started. And he will be here just shortly. But it, it's not fair to punish the timely for those that can't get here. So, don't let, so I thought we would get started. We've got a, we've got a very interesting and ample program that we want to review this morning with you. So I'll just say thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm I, I quite, just to tell you about my, my personal uh, professional f interests these days and focus. Um, I'm, I've become obsessed with the interface between the public and private sector in accomplishing good things in the world. Uh, it was a fascinating study that was done, gosh, about eight years ago now, by the World Bank. Uh, and and the, the World Bank study was, it was trying to explain what, is the, what, are, what accounts for wealth of nations. Is the wealth of a nation determined by the natural resources, you know, the quality of the fishing stocks, the mineral resources under the ground, the, the climate and agricultural capacities? Was it, was it natural resources? Was it caused by man-made resources, uh, factories, uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, housing stock? You know, was it a product of thing of human imagination, or the third category was called intangible wealth, intangible resources? Excuse me, and and that was things like um, the sense of legitimacy of government, the you know, protection of intellectual property the quality of education, uh, the quality of a legal system and a sense of fairness in society, uh, the sense of common purpose uh, among citizens. So this intangible resource that was drawn on, and overwhelmingly, part of it was a bit of an artifice of the, of the analytic technique they used, but overwhelmingly, the primary cause of or source of wealth in the country were these intangible resources. It wasn't the physical or the man-made, it was these intangible resources. And if you think about it, all of those things, the quality, the stability of a currency, the quality of an education system, the legitimacy of, of courts, all of these things are the product of good government. And where there's good governance, you tend to find wealth. And point to places like Singapore or Finland, you know, or Norway, you know, where there are quality governance and you find growing wealth. Uh, the long list of places where there's poor government and poverty is a high, high correlation, you know. So, so I'm very interested in this question of, uh, of how do we promote better lives for people through promoting better governance, better quality government. Now, we're going to explore something really interesting today. And we've got three colleagues that are going to be sharing us insights into uh, innovation. Innovation as business people trying to make money. But in every one of these instances, they're also improving the quality of life, the quality of human condition through this. Exactly the role of government. This is what government wants. Now, we've had a project here for the last couple of years on the relationship of, of the profit-seeking private sector to the development agenda. Now, that's a little bit of an anomaly in Washington, because in Washington, development is if you love AID, you know, you're a Democrat and you love AID and you champion AID. And if you're a Republican, you hate USAID and you criticize it any chance you can. You know, so sterile, pointless debate. What we're all after is people having better lives, stronger and healthier communities, healthier societies. That's something both liberals and conservatives want, maybe for different motivations, but they both want that. It's something that, that the business community wants. It's something that government wants. We all want to see this grow. So the government has a very keen and I think real interest in helping the private sector make money. Now, you wouldn't find that in our narrative in Washington. That is not part of the narrative of Washington. And it's kind of a we-them 
adversarial sort of relationship, but we need to change the terms of this debate. If we really want to have healthier communities, because for security reasons, safety reasons, or humanitarian reasons, it's going to be a better world, it's in our interest to help the private sector champion the improvement of the human condition. And you're going to hear three examples today, three really interesting examples today of how this is happening. So I think this is a, a, a part of, a, of an important effort. This is not just about looking at what one or two or three companies is doing for their own bottom line. It's what we're doing to try to create stronger, healthier communities on a global basis. It's good for America, and it's good for the world, and we're going to have a chance to explore some of that today. My thanks to Gilead for making possible this uh, event today, but also for the work that they're doing in championing some of these very innovative ideas. Scott, why don't I ask you to come on up and let's get this started for real. Uh, I, I'm, my role here is ornament, ornamental, uh, and I'm a, this is Scott Miller, and he's going to get us kicked off. Scott, take it over. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Well, good morning. Let me add my welcome to CSIS. I would like to welcome all, all those who are uh, viewing this online on our webcast. We usually have about as many people online as we do in the audience, so that's, uh, that's, that's a good thing. My name is Scott Miller. I'm the William Scholl Chair in International Business here at CSIS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to CSIS's facility and to the Commercial Innovation Conference. In Washington, many people, when you use the term in innovation, think about product invention, the latest gadget, the latest uh, product. That, uh, and certainly that's a very important part of innovation, which is something we're all familiar with and use all the time. However, innovation is much deeper and broader, in, and all kinds of things happen in the production and distribution process that are true innovation and yet often missed by the policy community and often missed by those of us who are consumers or, or uh, beneficiaries of the technologies. Many of us probably could theorize that there's a lot of innovation in the production process, and it's often unseen. Production innovation is very deep and broad. Uh, the most innovative companies uh, do things that make products m less expensive, more reliable, better functioning. There's a tremendous amount of work that goes on after the product is invented. And you know, think about your own mobile phones. You probably got a mobile phone if you're if you're a uh, Washington type sometime in the last 20 years. Maybe a little. Maybe you were an early adopter, and you had one of the Gordon Gecko, you know, shoe size Maxwell Smart uh, cellular phones uh, from from the great company Motorola. And you look at the level of of commercial innovation that's happened in that industry since then, and the amount of improvement that's taken place. You can see that. The, in, the innovation that's unseen often is innovation in distribution channels, what, what, you, what companies have to do to reach consumers and get adoption of these amazing products. That's really today's conference. Today's conference is about innovative products, and, it, and they had an important distinction. They're innovative products that required additional further commercial innovation in order to succeed with the consumers they were intended for all along. I'll, uh, keep my remarks to sort of what to watch for. And three things that I ask you to observe as the, as the presentations go on today. First is that, that, that know-how matters, that what you'll find in each of the three case studies is uh, uh, that the organizations are quite sophisticated and disciplined, and that they experience and represent deep knowledge of both the subject matter and their consumers or patients. There, there, there's tremendous amount of energy and devoted way beyond the invention of the chemical or the invention of the device uh, that, that, that makes, these, makes these innovation stories a success. The second theme that's true of all three case studies is that the existing business model for distributing or, or, or getting market acceptance of the products was, was unacceptable. It was inadequate in some way. And that, for me, is an interesting component. If you look at innovators will tell you that failure is a very important part of success. And one of the ways that things fail is when you have a product that is actually successful, meets consumers' needs, is appealing in many ways, and yet the pieces in place required to get it to the consumer are not, are, don't, either don't exist or, or don't allow for full penetration to the market. 
So this notion of, of dealing with an, uh, having a, an, an innovative, successful product and then dealing with an inadequate business model required the invention of the business model, which I think you'll find interesting. The third thing is that public policy matters. Public policy uh, in all three of these cases can by, be either a barrier or a catalyst to commercial innovation. With that as sort of preview of the conference, uh, I would uh, like to uh, welcome our first speaker, uh, who is going to establish the policy context. Stan McCoy is Assistant U.S. Trade Representative for International Intellectual Property and Innovation from the Office of U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, Stan uh, has, has just joined us. Uh, we, we ought to, we're, this is not an infrastructure con conference, but the infrastructure mattered in this case. Uh, I will tell you just as an aside, I was driving into the building and on the 6.45 a.m. traffic report, there was an accident on the Beltway in Maryland, an accident on the Beltway in Virginia, and there was single tracking on the red line. So, in other words, Wednesday. <laughs> so, <laughs> in any case, we're delighted Stan could join us. Uh, Stan is the Chief Policy Advisor to the United States Trade Representative and the Administration Agencies on Intellectual Property and Trade Issues, and is responsible for developing and implementing the U.S. Trade Policy on Intellectual Property. The USTR office that Stan manages also coordinates innovation policy trade issues such as those related to pharmaceuticals and medical technology and the intersection between IP trade rules and competition policy. Uh, Stan's a long practitioner in this, in this field, is uh, viewed as a real expert by those of us who get into the weeds of intellectual property and innovation, and we're delighted to welcome him here today. Stan McCoy. Thanks a lot for uh, welcoming me, Scott, and I'm uh, glad to have the opportunity to speak with all of you and uh, uh, delighted to be able to make a uh, dramatic entrance thanks to the, thanks to the metro system. Uh, it uh, always, uh, always keeps us on, a st on our toes here in Washington. Uh, the, uh, the topic today of commercial innovation is, uh, is near and dear to the heart of policymakers in Washington, innovation is that, that is that stuff internationally that every economy wants to say that that they've got and that they're good at promoting. And uh, we're in the fortunate position, in the United States, of uh, being able to uh, speak truthfully when we say that. Uh, but we don't take it for granted. Uh, the administration has said many times that America's future economic growth and international competitiveness depends on our continued capacity to innovate. Uh, we create jobs and industries for the future by doing what we do best in the United States, investing in the creativity and innovation of our people. Uh, the President has said uh, that to win the future, we must out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. Uh, and we must also take responsibility for some, of the, uh, for some of the circumstances that we create for our economy here at home, including our deficit, uh, the need to invest in making America stronger, the need to invest in infrastructure, for example, Scott, to pick up on your theme, uh, and uh, reforming how our government operates so that we uh, can focus on promoting economic growth and preparing for the challenges of the 21st century. So the part of that strategy that I work on, trade policy, lives in a broader context that I want to talk about for a couple of minutes, because I think if you look at the, the presentations that we're uh, looking forward to this morning, uh, they speak to not only the sort of trade and regulatory context, but the broader context uh, in which we can try to catalyze commercial innovation. The administration's innovation strategy is really a pyramid structure and the, the bottom of that pyramid are the building blocks of American innovation, which consist of uh, educating Americans with 21st century skills and creating a world-class workforce, uh, strengthening and broadening American leadership in fundamental research, uh, building a leading physical infrastructure, and developing an advanced information technology ecosystem. Now, on top of that base layer of the pyramid, uh, you have a number of steps that the administration is taking broadly to try to promote market-based innovation. Uh, they include uh, in accelerating business innovation with the R&E tax credit, 
uh, promoting investments in ingenuity through effective intellectual property policy and patent reforms, encouraging high growth and innovation-based entrepreneurship, and promoting innovative, open, and competitive markets at home and around the world uh, in the global economy that we do business in. Uh, we're fond of saying at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative that 95 percent of the world's consumers live outside the borders of the United States. So that last point about competitive markets and the global marketplace is particularly important. Uh, on top of that layer of the pyramid is uh, an additional set of priorities for catalyzing uh, breakthroughs on particular national priorities. Uh, those include unleashing clean energy revolution, uh, accelerating biotechnology, nanotechnology, and advanced manufacturing, uh, developing breakthroughs in space applications, uh, breakthroughs in uh, educational and healthcare technologies, and so on. Uh, so it's on top of those foundations of a strong market that you can then move on to try to catalyze particular priority areas. And of course, it's on top of all of that underlying government policy that we then see the opportunities for the private sector to engage in the kind of innovation uh, that we're going to talk about here today. Uh, the administration is determined to ensure that U.S. trade policy plays its part in helping American companies and workers compete in global markets uh, and create the underlying conditions uh, for innovation and competition to the benefit of businesses and consumers worldwide. Uh, that's why we're trying to tackle some of the problems that increasingly affect trade in the 21st century. Uh, for example, we're seeking new disciplines in our ongoing trade negotiations to address trade uh, distortions and unfair competition associated with the increasing engagement of large state-owned enterprises in international trade. We're also actively combating localization barriers to trade. Those are measures that are designed to protect, favor, or stimulate domestic industries, service providers, or intellectual property at the expense of goods, services, and IP from other countries. The use of those kinds of measures has dramatically increased in the last few years, especially in some of the world's largest and fastest growing markets. Uh, localization barriers to trade present significant market access obstacles and can block or inhibit U.S. exports in uh, many key markets. They include things like requiring goods to be produced locally, providing preferences for the purchase of domestically manufactured or produced uh, goods and services and requiring firms to transfer technology in order to trade in a foreign market. Those kinds of measures are, in our view, trade distortive. They create an, un uh, an uneven playing field and they make it harder to engage in commercial innovation. Uh, we also want to create some of the uh, conditions in terms of the intellectual property system that will support innovation for both producers and consumers alike. Uh, IP is a key source of American jobs, competitiveness, and prosperity. Uh, according to the Department of Commerce, IP intensive industries in 2010 directly accounted for 27.1 million American jobs and approximately 34.8 percent of U.S. GDP. To sustain those vast and vital economic benefits, the United States in, 2013, in 2013 is continuing to seek greater market access for IP-intensive U.S. products and to protect job-supporting innovation uh, as part of a balanced policy that benefits both producers and users of innovative products and services uh, world, worldwide. Uh, we're leaders in the United States in innovative industries ranging from uh, development of high technology uh, to, uh, uh, to entertainment and the fine arts, uh, and we support market-based competition and respect for the work of intellectual property rights holders in every country, and you see that reflected both in the trade agreements that have uh, come into force in recent years with Korea, Colombia, and Panama, and also in our very active ongoing trade agenda in the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade negotiations, uh, where we're work working with that set of partners to advance state-of-the-art high standard provisions. And you see opportunities in that regard in our early days uh, Trans-Pacific trade, tr trans trade and Investment Partnership negotiations 
excuse me, transatlantic trade and investment partnership negotiations uh, with Europe. I think both of these opportunities are critical to us, and we're spending a lot of time uh, on TPP right now, trying to bring home that agreement by the end of the year, as our leaders and trade ministers have asked us to do. So our major process innovation at USTR right now is learning how to burn the candle at both ends and in the middle at the same time. Uh, but hopefully with uh, continued uh, very intensive work on that agreement, we'll be able to bring home a good result for U.S. innovators uh, and creators uh, and expand uh, jobs and opportunities in the critical Asia-Pacific region. Uh, that's uh, by no means all we're doing. Uh, I, I want to come back to the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership in a moment, uh, but I do want to mention uh, some of the other work that we do outside of these major trade negotiations to try to aggressively defend the millions of American jobs that are threatened by theft of U.S. intellectual property around the world. Uh, we use our Special 301 process, for example. We collaborate with trading partners to develop and implement uh, solutions on issues of concern. We develop action plans like the one we're uh, pursuing with uh, Russia following their accession to the WTO. Uh, so we've got a very active agenda of trying to set market conditions uh, that allow people to capture value added in their goods and services uh, through intellectual property protections like patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Uh, interestingly, Scott, when I turn to the examples that we're, we're going to talk about this morning, uh, these aren't necessarily your conventional cases of, uh, of, uh, of IP or uh, IP-related barriers, and that, I think, presents an intriguing possibility uh, because one of the negotiations that we have on the horizon at USTR is in fact an unconventional one uh, from the standpoint of IP. That's our transatlantic trade and investment partnership uh, with Europe. And in that area, I think we have a tremendous opportunity right now uh, to look to uh, open up new markets and approach the challenges of IP protection in new ways, because we start with that partner in a place where we haven't started in any of our previous trade agreements, where we've really got a strong standard of IP protection and enforcement in place already, and we're looking to build on that with new disciplines. So one of the things I'd ask you to think about today uh, as we hear about the examples of commercial innovation that we're going to talk about is what opportunities would be presented in a new kind of trade agreement as we're pursuing with the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership to set background conditions that can promote the kind of commercial innovation uh, that we're talking about today. Uh, I'm also very interested in the fact that some of the examples we're talking about today uh, it, it involve what I would call secondary value propositions around a product or service that was first uh, that, that was that was that was first developed or brought to market with a different value proposition in mind. So, for example, if we're talking about if we, if we're talking about a, a water purification product that was not able to be successfully commercialized on the first try. Uh, but a secondary value proposition was found where that could be uh, where that could be brought to the market in a different way. Uh, that may speak to us about opportunities for innovation that are outside the uh, conventional mainstream. And I think it's a challenging question for all of us to look at, say, how do we create conditions for that kind of innovation? That particular innovation was recognized, for example, by the uh, USPTO Patents for Humanity program. I think it's worth asking whether there are other kinds of ways to reinforce secondary value propositions through measures like that. Uh, you're also going to hear from Gilead Sciences today. I know Gilead is a participant in the medicines patent pool. There's another idea of how you reinforce a secondary value proposition, allow the, uh, the use of uh, patented innovations that have been developed by the biopharmaceutical innovation, by the biopharmaceutical industry, or by innovators like our our own, uh, uh, our own uh, national science initiatives here in the United States uh, to be deployed in new ways and uh, extract new forms of value. So I would be very intrigued, Scott, to uh, learn more about what kinds of conclusions we can draw from the conference and the presentations this morning about unconventional new ways to try to 
uh, underline secondary value propositions uh, and create uh, conditions that uh, allow them to take hold uh, and uh, grow and create jobs and innovation opportunities for the United States. Thank you. Thanks very much. Stands agreed to take a few questions, if there are any. Uh, there are basically, here at CSIS, three rules for questions. First, wait for the microphone, uh, because we're live webcasting this. Uh, second, when you receive the microphone, introduce yourself and your organization. The third rule is ask the question in a form of a question. <laughs> so thank you. Anybody uh, have a question for Stan? Shake off the cobwebs this morning. Yes, sir. My name is Ed Gerwin. I'm an international trade consultant. Stan, I have a question. You mentioned um, the idea of creating background conditions for companies to be able to keep compete more effectively in international markets. And I know in the ongoing negotiations, particularly in the TPP, there's been much discussion of supply chains. Could, could you give us an idea of some of the kinds of background conditions that you're trying to set in those negotiations uh, to make supply chains work more effectively, and um, most importantly, to make sure that American companies can get their fair share of global supply chains so we can create opportunity and jobs here? Yeah, th thanks for the question. It's a good one. I think supply chain. Uh, I, I, I think supply chain issues are are all the rage right now. It's one of the 21st issue, 21st century issues that we're looking at in the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, trade negotiations, where we're really trying to grapple with some of the new challenges that we're facing. I think we're still in the midst of working through exactly what it is that we can do. We're also talking in the World Trade Organization right now about trade facilitation, which is which gets to some of the same issues of how is it that you really get goods and services across borders and ensure uh, and, and ensure we can get you know goods goods and services to consumers quickly in a global marketplace. Uh, one of the supply chain issues we wrestle with constantly in the in the intellectual property space is ensuring the integrity of uh, supply chains, including sometimes our own. Uh, government and defense supply chains against counterfeit goods and the kind of leakage of those goods that can uh, that can come in and threaten you know not only uh, uh, not only commercial actors but uh, consumers as well so I think there's a there's a, a host of challenges there I'm sure we will we will only be able to wrestle with a limited number of them in the TPP I hope that TTIP will present new opportunities to uh, wrestle with some more of those challenges, but I think it's really, uh, I think it's really fertile ground. And when you, uh, w when you look at the examples we're going to talk about today, I was struck by the, uh, uh, by the, by the UPS example where you have a, you know, basically a packaging product that's treated as an import and some, uh, 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 under some customs rules, and and what kind of supply chain issues would that create for you if all of a sudden, the, if, if if all of a sudden the, the packaging was in Introducing a whole new tariff proposition, you had to, you had to wrestle with. So I think there are. I, I think within the concept of supply chain broadly conceived, uh, there's all kinds of problems you could wrestle with, and uh, how many of those, uh, how many of those will come under that rubric for the for the TPP is something we're still working on. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. My name is Bill Mounts. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, and the Northwest regional clusters out there would like to ask Scott, how are you doing as the U.S. Trade Representative in reconciling our twin national objectives of trade, but also export controls? And specifically with TPP, is that going to be on the same plateau as the Atlantic um, current state? Thanks. 
Yeah, so uh, export control is not, really my, uh, not re really my personal area of expertise, but I can say that uh, trade and, 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 uh, and innovation really go hand in hand for us, and we're trying to promote uh, all kinds of exports, including the area of innovation. Of course, uh, we, do have, uh, you know, we do have certain export control laws that, that, have, to be, uh, that have to be respected, and that's, that's, a, uh, that's a reality of the, uh, the trading environment. But you know, my, experience in the, uh, my, my experience in the IP space is that, uh, uh, that those, uh, 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 those cover a very, uh, a very limited space, and we're still uh, uh, and we're still very successful in IP exports. I don't know if that matches up with your, uh, with, with, with your experience. Well, just making sure that the Trans-Pacific is not given the same, just trying to make sure that the Trans-Pacific Accord is given the same status as the Transatlantic Accord, which we have quite a success with. Understood. Thanks. Yes. Della. Up front here. Thanks. I'm Thelma Ask. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS, and I have uh, kind of a two-part question. One is uh, with respect to intellectual property rights protection and the ITC and what you're seeing when you're negotiating with our trading partners. Do you see any changes that need to be made there with respect to how uh, we review intellectual uh, property rights protections in the U.S.? And what are you pushing for in other countries with respect to how they are going to look at intellectual property rights protection. And that leads me to the second question about uh, capacity building in this area and others in your uh, negotiations. Uh, we're discussing that a lot within the CSIS about how to marry uh, capacity building um, uh, needs uh, with uh, both private sector and public sector capacity building efforts. Yeah, thanks. That's a that's a great question. In terms of intellectual property and expectations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we're looking for a high standard agreement on intellectual property, one that will uh, stand alongside the other agreements that we already have in that region with uh, uh, with partners like uh, uh, Australia, Singapore, Chile, Peru, uh, and the uh, Chorus Free Trade Agreement with, between the United States and South Korea. So a strong IP standard there is critical. We also see it is important to uh, build on that standard in certain ways. Uh, there are some 21st century challenges that we haven't addressed in past trade agreements that I think we can address in the TPP. One of them would be theft of trade secrets, for example, very important to the kind of uh, process innovation that we're talking about today because sometimes your innovation is not you know, a patented invention but a, a way of making the product better, whether you're making glass or paint or dozens of other things. Uh, and the, uh, and the ability to hold that information as, a, as protected uh, is, is just increasingly critical around the world, and it's critical for uh, U.S. investors who want to be, be able to participate in a global marketplace that they don't lose that. I say that just as one of several examples where I think the TPP gives us an opportunity not only to do what we've done before, but to uh, stretch our ambitions into new areas. And for the most part, we've found uh, our partners in the TPP uh, willing to engage in that discussion with us and uh, work towards the shared goal of an ambitious agreement. So we're now, we, you know, we're now at a critical juncture where we'll see if we can deliver that or not. Um, in, in, in terms of capacity building, it's a great point. I think one of the things, uh, uh, one of the challenges we have in the area of value-added trade is we're talking about not just simple trade propositions where you're dealing with uh, uh, where you're dealing with routine customs issues. I think we're going to hear this morning sometimes even routine customs issues aren't so routine. Uh, but now you're talking about uh, patents, uh, patents, trademarks, copyrights. Uh, these can be uh, subtle and difficult matters that require actual rule of law capacity on the part of 
of not just uh, not just uh, line officials, but uh, judges and 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 private attorneys in the system. And how do you create that rule of law capacity? So that really, what we're talking about when we talk about uh, trade based on innovation is the ability to profit from value added in the global marketplace that often only exists in the form of a legal fiction, uh, a patent or a copyright. Uh, and uh, in order to capture value from those kinds of uh, f from, from, from those kinds of operations, uh, you've got to have a rule of law uh, expectation that's met in overseas markets. And that's been, that's been a challenge of the last quarter, quarter century for U.S. trade policy. But I think you're absolutely right to underline that the, uh, that the capacity building aspect of that is critical because you can put all kinds of wonderful laws on the books and if the capacity isn't there uh, for judges and law enforcement officials to make them real in practice, then they won't be. Yes, sir. Final question. Thank you. Joe Mahanning, co-founder of Open Revolution. Um, picking up on the issue of patents, this administration has been refreshingly aggressive against uh, patent squatting uh, and defensive uses of IP rights here domestically. Could you comment on how that, does that carry over into your international trade agenda uh, and how do you strike the balance in terms of protecting IP rights with respect to innovation? Yeah, I think it. I, I think it does carry over in the sense that patent quality is really critical for us, not only domestically, but internationally. And if you if you look ahead at some of the challenges out there, I mean, you have a you, you have, for example, in China, a, a coming wave of enormous patent quality problems, owing to the fact that a, a huge proportion of the patents on the books in China are unexamined so-called utility model patents that may be of highly dubious quality. Uh, and so I think you will see in overseas markets many of the same challenges uh, that we've been uh, grappling with here domestically. And I think we have the opportunity to set a good, uh, a good example in which we underline the importance of a strong patent system with quality patents uh, and the value that that brings home to all of us uh, by also showing our commitment to uh, rooting out low quality patents uh, through initiatives like the existing patent reforms and also addressing the problems of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of inappropriate behavior by by some marginal patent holders through initiatives like the ones that the uh, White House announced last summer uh, with respect to the problems around non-practicing entities. So I think those kinds of uh, initiatives ultimately all share the goal of a strong patent system. We want that domestically. We very much want that internationally as well. And I think that you know we will increasingly see others grappling with the kinds of challenges we're grappling with. So it's critical that we set a good example there. Please join me in thanking Stan for his contribution. Thank you.